Okay, world peace is not what I'm really hoping for, but I'm pretty sure we can get to somewhere. Thank you very much, and a lot of you are also part of the program committee for this conference. And thank you for your time, and sorry for spamming your inbox with a lot of email. But um, welcome to the panel on license compliance dispute resolution. <laughs> well, this, this will work, this will work. The fundamental focus of the copyleft licenses is the preservation of users' rights to run programs for any purpose, to copy, modify, and share without restriction. Compliance obligations are parsimoniously imposed by the licenses only to the extent that the drafters of the licenses and the licensors using them consider to be minimally necessary to protect downstream users' rights. The GNU licenses create a commons in traditional economic vocabulary. The restrictions imposed by the license are governance or management rules for the commons, like fisheries quotas or groundwater preservation regulations in land use. Parties' obligations to the commons depend on their role in relation to its resources. For those of us who have been working on trust building amongst the different actors of the commons, Current state of affairs presents multiple friction points. We saw the legal maneuvers of Ameriprise, Zimpleware, and Versata on GPL version 2 and its provisions in the summer of 2014. We have received limited information on Christoph Helwig's lawsuit against VMware in the District Court of Hamburg in Germany. We are receiving a constant and a steady stream of information, limited though, about monetization of the copyright on the Linux kernel in Europe, to the surprise and chagrin of many. It seems no longer are all copyright holders in copylefted projects adhering to the practices that maximize trust and minimize fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It also seems apt that this is the time, and the time is right, to restore the understandings that allowed our mechanisms legal, and social to triumph in the first place. Many dialogues, discussions will have to be conducted. A multi-pronged strategy will have to be adopted to reach there. And this is a step in that direction. This conversation is intended to build a positive consensus about compliance structures that work well for everyone in the community, while encouraging widespread adoption of FOSS. We have both commercial and non-commercial parties who have contributed to the creation of trusted commons. Today amongst ourselves, we have a very diverse and distinguished group. We have our client, John Sullivan, the executive director of the Free Software Foundation. We have commercial parties that are an extremely valuable and important part of the commons, including Eileen Evans, the vice president and deputy general counsel of Software Cloud and Open Source for Hewlett Packard. Karen Copenhaver, who is a partner at Chort, Hall, and Stuart LLP's Business and Technology Group, and the Director of Intellectual Property Strategy for the Linux Foundation. Terry Lardy, who specializes in open source and copyright matters for the IBM Corporation, where he's copyrights, uh, copy, uh, IBM's Copyright Council. Richard Fontana, our distinguished alumnus and the oh, resident open source expert at Red Hat. And, um, sorry. Jim Wright, the Chief Architect for Open Source Policy, Strategy, Compliance, and Alliances at Oracle, unless you want a different introduction. And David Marr. We call him the Oracle. This dialogue has already started, so I'm very hopeful. David Marr, who is the Vice President, Legal Counsel at Qualcomm Technologies and leading the Open Chain Working Group at the Linux Foundation. Thank you all for joining us here. In the first part of the conversation, we will hear from our distinguished panelists as to how their organizations see compliance, how you have learned it's not rocket science, it's not difficult to get it right, how your processes have matured over time, and the variety of actions, things that you have done to make compliance more efficient. 
what will follow is my keeping quiet and just presenting some questions to the panelists and where they will have a dialogue amongst themselves and opine upon and uh, questions and some other comments how to reach a positive consensus uh, within the community. And we'll also have a Q&A round by the audience later on. So without further ado, I request you all to start, Eileen. Okay, I want to take a slightly different approach um, and provide a little bit about my background and experience prior to HP because I think, quite frankly, it's, it's largely shaped how I look at open source issues and my approach towards them. So I started my career at DLA Piper, which is a, a large law firm, uh, and I started in their tech trans group. Um, I w had the opportunity to work on an open source matter when I was at DLA, and I was hooked. It was just really a lot of fun. It was a GPL issue, and it was uh, a technology client had posed a question about the interpretation of, of GPL. And from that point on, I was just hooked on open source. I found it fascinating, fun, you know, just a really exciting area in which to practice law. Uh, from DLA, I went to Sun Microsystems, and I was at Sun for about 10 years. Um, I, Dave and I worked together there for about a decade, and I think it largely shaped how I look at open source. Uh, Sun was the largest contributor to open source at that time, and they took a really different approach to open source, and that's sort of where I, I kind of grew up in open source. It's where I first worked with Eben and Karen and other folks, and I had the opportunity to really, it kind of shaped how I look at open source and then the importance of compliance overall, to be candid. Um, I moved then to HP, I've been with HP now for five years. And at HP, I have the opportunity to uh, run not only the legal function of, of open source, but also I run our open source program office, which is largely engineers and program managers, and it's very focused on you know, the compliance. And the reason we have of the group, at, we have a group as a single group, which includes lawyers, engineers, program managers, is because we look at compliance and open source issues from multiple lenses, from the lens of the developer, the community, the legal lens, and our interpretation is it's much better to look at this through multifaceted lens. We'll come to a better understanding, better solution that way. I work really closely with BDL Garvey. He's, a, he's in the audience in the, in the tie-dye here, front row. <laughs> And he is in the office of the CTO. So he reports to Martin, um, to Martin Fink, our CTO of the company. And B. Dale and I work very closely with Martin Fink. Um, Martin was our first VP of open source at HP, so he has a wonderful, deep knowledge of open source. So it's just it's so much fun to work on open source issues with B. Dale and Martin. It's really, you know, a, a, a lot of fun and very challenging and um, really interesting issues pop up. In terms of our compliance, HP has had a strong history in compliance before I joined. Uh, the things that I have done in my role since joining HP is I've tried to take the learnings that I had from Sun and quite frankly my law firm days early on and try to apply those to what we're doing in open source. Um, some of the things that we're doing in the compliance area right now we're focusing on, we're just in the process of revamping, completely revamping our training program. And we're doing it more for um, what today's engineer and audience wants. So we're doing training modules for not only lawyers, but also for engineers and our developers and our program managers. Because again, we recognize that for compliance, we really need to have all of the folks coming from a consistent place of understanding open source. And then also it, it provides us an opportunity to really have those dialogues and to be candid. We've started rolling out our training program this year, the new one. We've been making tweaks and modifications as we go along as well, because we'll get great input from developers or from engineers or others in the, in the, that were in the process of training, and we'll incorporate that feedback back into the module. So we're in the process of kind of constantly keeping that up to date. Uh, the other thing from a compliance perspective is we um, focus on the process. So it's important, we think, to have folks educated and understanding open source compliance, the importance of it, what it means, what their role is in that, and then being very clear in a process of what people, you know, what folks' roles are if, the, you know, if compliance um, questions arise. Thank you. So I want to um, talk in about two different things. And the first, the first, because when we think about compliance, we think about these compliance processes, which are very important. But uh, right now, we're also thinking about compliance in terms of enforcement, and, which is what you were raising. And, and they're really two, you know, two different parts of it. 
Um, I read this wonderful article in the Times this weekend that I w made me think about this, and it made me think about a, a book. Um, how many people have read Leadership in um, Without Easy Answers? It's a, it's Ron. Uh, do you ever, it's a Harvard professor. I want to say Ron Heifetz, but uh, I'm not sure I have exactly the right Ron, last name right. Um, if it, it, it is a fundamental book about political leadership. And it says, you know, there are two kinds of issues. There are those where you have technical fixes, where you can just change something, and everybody's expectations are met. And then there are those that are hard. And there were, there's, uh, are the issues where people have to change their minds. They have to change their understandings. They have to change their expectations. And how does a political leader do that? Um, and the, in the book, one of the examples is, is the civil rights era and the political leaders that were involved. It's a wonderful book. So the article this, um, this weekend in the Times was about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Did anybody read it? It was wonderful. It, did, it, wasn't, it was lovely. And, and the people who had worked with her through her whole life said that the greatest thing about her was her wisdom. Because she had issues that she was passionate about. But she, follow, just following the guidelines from this book perfectly, was part of the process of saying, how far do you push? When do you push? You know, how far do you go? And, and the, uh, the person writing who had been one of her clerks said, and every time we didn't follow her advice, we lost. You know, when we reached too far, when we went to, but that process of guiding and changing behaviors. For those of you who are just new to open source, you have no idea how amazing it is that we are in this room today and everyone's using this open using it in the middle of the 90s you know I mean people thought we were freaking crazy I'd have people come up and say nobody's ever gonna do that I mean you know that's you know nobody's ever gonna do that and I think what you can't imagine is how carefully the conversation about these licenses and the enforcement, et cetera, has been managed by people in, in this room uh, in order to permit the public mind to change, in order to permit the understanding to grow, in order to enable companies to be determine that these were commercially reasonable things to do, and to understand the power of collaboration. And that would never have happened if anything had been jammed down their throats. How do you conduct a conversation? How do you time the information? How do you enable people to come to an understanding? How do you guide people to change is a political art form. And the enforcement of these licenses has been part of a masterful plan, I think, in many ways, but a masterful conversation that has enabled this adoption in ways that are so astounding to me that every once in a while I have to step back and really my breath is taken away, that we're all in this room. And to go forward from here without understanding how important that political process of change is and how challenging it is and how challenging it is across cultures is for us to be uh, almost flippant about how much work and how much intelligence has gone before us. So I just want to—I want to start this conversation to say thank you for you know the people in this room who were guiding that conversation over you know more than a decade and, and enabling this political conversion that has us all here today because it was a gift. It was a gift. Yes. Leadership Without Easy Answers. It's a great book. It's, you know, in those situations, it has all these political situations where people were, where, you know, people's understandings of issues actually changed. And the civil rights one is just a phenomenal thing. So the other thing I have to say is that, you know, the Linux Foundation has been, you know, um, involved in so many ways I couldn't begin to say it in five minutes in, uh, in establishing you know, open source compliance methods and education and support for companies to understand how these things work. Because it was also a big challenge for lawyers to learn how to collaborate. And, you know, there is no book that, uh, you know, well, now we have a book of materials, but, you know, to go and read this, what the, 
<laughs> He's like, it's I'm resonating. Just, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing at the idea that that's happening. <laughs> well, sort of, it's, it is to some degree, think, think yeah. about how we well look at all the lawyers in the room but you know it, it is I mean generally lawyers want to compete with each other one up and and we you know there was a there was a time when there there was you know or a lot of litigation attorneys who spent a lot of time flaming each other and um, and because they wanted yeah. to one up the fact that the in-house counsel who actually work with this work together is another major change. And the Linux Foundation has an open compliance program and it's a place where you know, we really uh, focused on helping companies uh, make compliance efficient and build it into their processes. And, uh, and that's a slow and steady process, but one that I'm actually really proud of. And Eileen and, I, and many of you have been involved in that uh, over a course of many years, and we can talk about that. Thank you, Karen. You're yeah, all at the cooling party now. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, might, might be sample bias in the lawyers. Right, that might be sample bias in the lawyers who are choosing this. There might be. There might be. There's, there's a microphone out there, and people would like to hear those comments. <laughs> I don't know if they should. But okay. <laughs> this is a sign they are collaborating slowly, inching towards collaboration, learning from the community that lawyers can also collaborate. Terry Lardy, please, Terry. Sure. <clears throat> Karen, actually, I, what I'm going to try and do is take you through uh, 15 years of uh, compliance, the compliance process at IBM in the next five minutes. But what Karen's story kind of reminded me of something I wasn't going to mention, but I was working at the time, it's about 1998, I'm working in uh, York, IBM's Yorktown Heights Research Lab, the Thomas J. Watson Research Center, which sometimes was referred to as Berkeley East, kind of the granola and sandals crowd. And one of our managers actually walked into my office with a copy of the GPL version 2. And he wanted to distribute a piece of software using it. And I looked, I said, I have, I have to read this. And so he, he said, all right. He came back the next day and I said, you can't do this. And um, the uh, researchers and scientists were a lot sharper about this than I was. It took me a while to be won over. Uh, eventually, as you probably know, we made a big move there. So in the beginning, we were actually under instructions to clear each and every open source distribution or use that IBM made. And it was, this was not just cleared by me, it was cleared by actually a committee of executives, of vice presidents, who had a, a team working for them, I was on the team, uh, who, who are presumably people who knew what, what was actually going on. Uh, we did that for a little while until that just kind of things kind of collapsed because what happened was the proposals were going up really rapidly. And what was actually happening is that we were a roadblock. Um, it was a very cumbersome uh, review. We it was a hierarchical review so that um, a line level attorney would look at it, then, the, then her manager would look at it, and then her manager's manager would look at it, and then it would come to this star chamber and they would look at it. And at the end of the day, the interesting thing was by the time you got to the star chamber, everything went through. But there had been a lot of forming and shaping going on. But really, I think to a certain extent, the role had become, because we were afraid of open source. I have to be quite honest about it. You have to understand, I, lawyers in particular, but IBM in particular, came from a position where we really greatly valued intellectual property. It's in our DNA. Um, You've all heard about our patent portfolio, and this was always very important to us. So the idea that you come along with these licenses, which kind of flip it on its head, flip that whole um, intellectual property paradigm on its head was just like, it was, it was a little bit hard to absorb in the beginning. So we worried about a lot of things. We worried about the provenance of the code. When our, when our programs are creating code, we knew where it came from, right? We had some control over it. And we would have them fill out forms and swear and, and did, you know, give us their firstborn children that they hadn't done certain bad things. Uh, so we worried about the provenance, and you can't really get that as easily for open source code. We worried about loss of value of our patent portfolio because we have a huge number of patents, and we did recognize that we're going to be allowing other people to use them to a certain extent, depending on which license. Uh, you're looking at. We worried about infringing other people's patents. Um, we really did. And there were certain, as you all know, I won't mention names, but there were certain players in the industry who were openly hostile to open source code. And they were big. And they had portfolios of their own. And we wanted to stay out of the court, basically. 
But what I will say is that from the very beginning, we were very concerned about compliance. We wanted to make sure we followed the license. We had a, we had a legal obligation to follow the license, but we also had a moral and ethical obligation to follow the license. So we took that very, very seriously. And that's oh, it's always been part of our process. Over the years, and the other thing I'll say about our process, has always been a joint effort between the, the code warriors and the business people and the attorneys. Yes, the, the attorneys would review the licenses. We would get reports. We'd get code scanned reports back, you know, where we'd actually, we have our own homegrown, own homegrown tool, uh, which has gone through many iterations over the years. It actually was developed by people who were, had, had to do the code scan, so those programs are in a position to actually make it more efficient, and we continue to do that. Uh, over the years, what we did, we got to a couple of places. Uh, we got comfortable with some stuff. We didn't really know anything about the communities, let's face it. This is all very new to us. As we grew to know more about the communities, some communities became trusted communities. There are certain communities out there where their process is pretty darn good. I mean, they are very careful about what they allow into their distributions. Uh, I mean, Apache is just one example. Um, and there are, there are others. So you got to a point where you can kind of more trust. You know, and, that, and I think... One of the things we've learned, sometimes hard, is that you have to have trust. Um, when you work with open source code, the community is your partner, and you've got to treat them like a partner, not like an adversary. Um, when you treat them like an adversary, things are going to unravel. When you treat them like a partner, now look, partnerships break up, right? You know, people get divorced, law firms dissolve. Not, not to say partners always agree with one another, but you have to, you are partners. Let's face it, they're, they're giving you something the same way one of your other, uh, another partner might be working on a piece of code with you. But over the years, we have made the reviews more efficient, I'd like to say. We have uh, allowed people, in certain instances, we know, we know some code so well, we basically say, you can use that without bothering us. Just go ahead and use it. Other code, we have a detailed database of information because we've looked at it already. And if there are issues, they're spotted in our database. We can go back to them so we don't have to go all the way up the chain. There are very few uh, reviews which we have to go all the way up the chain. Very few. And we do thousands of reviews now. Um, so we've gotten more and more efficient at it, which is not to say we're even close to perfect. We still get lots of complaints from our developers that we're slowing them down. And we take that very seriously. We, we really do. Um, la the latest chapter is I, I supervise a team of law school interns. They have been trained, excuse me, to do most of our most of our reviews. Thank you. They are very eager, uh, as law stu school students often are, and they do a very competent job. They all have comp sci degrees, and um, they take up a lot of my time. But it's not like I do all the thousands of reviews that they do. So, in the end, what I would say is that our process as we've gotten to know the community better, as we've gotten to understand it, as we've gotten more active in it, has become more and more efficient because we've learned what we need to do and what we don't need to do. But the one thing I can say is that the one, the one constant will be that we will be constantly changing it. Okay, thank you. So we've heard about your experience and the leadership without any, without easy answers, and the trust and the importance of partnership. And I'm going to turn to John Sullivan, and uh, this is where the party started. And John is the executive director of the Free Software Foundation, and also the copyright bar game, which is hack copyright law and turn it on its head and get copy left. And that's why we're all here. So John. Thank you. I think I'm also the only non-lawyer uh, here, but it's okay. I have a I have an MFA in poetry. That's almost the same thing. Um, <laughs> that's also okay because I'm, I'm sitting next to my lawyer. So it's, uh, um, and I, I do think that this conversation is is pretty remarkable that we're up here talking about the specifics of how to uh, make and distribute free software in in, in exactly the right way. Uh, and the best ways as opposed to whether we should be doing it at all. Uh, and so I think that's a, a very encouraging step that we've seen take place since the formation of the FSF. So I wanted to start just by putting our uh, GPL compliance and enforcement work in a bit of context and explain a little bit about how we do it. Um, we've been doing it for decades. Uh, I found a, a recent example uh, over the summer of a, a letter 
written in 1989 uh, about a compliance issue directed at a very significant technology company, and it reads like it could have been written yesterday. Um, so these conversations have been going on for a really long time. Uh, I've only been involved with them since 2003, um, but from my understanding of what came before I was at the FSF, we've been very consistent in the way that we've approached our uh, compliance and enforcement work ever since it started. So part of my job is to manage the licensing and compliance lab, the team of people that we have working in this area. That includes two staff members, Joshua Gay, who I hope will be here um, today. He lives down the road in Connecticut, and Donald Robertson, who's based in Seattle. And then, of course, we work with several members on our board who are um, experts in the area of licensing and, and with our uh, pro bono legal counsel at the Software Freedom Law Center. So it's not actually just GPL compliance. Uh, we've just in the last year, we've uh, raised and resolved issues about the LJPL uh, and even the GFTL. Uh, so, and we're certainly interested in issues regarding the AGPL. So we're really talking about the whole GNU family of uh, licenses, which include varying degrees of, of copyleft. And the way this works is that people email us reports of cases where they think uh, a company or a distributor is not following the terms of license in question. It's usually when they, they don't think that the complete and corresponding source code is being provided or offered along with the binary. And because our name is actually on the licenses, uh, you can imagine uh, that we get many reports on all variety of software. We get hundreds each year. Um, but since these licenses do depend on copyright, we're only really situated to follow up with the reports that involve software that's, whose copyright is held by the Free Software Foundation. Uh, so our compliance work focuses on potential violations involving GNU projects uh, where the FSF holds the copyright. The FSF doesn't hold the copyright on all GNU programs. Uh, it's up to the maintainers of the programs whether uh, they want to assign the copyright to us or not. Um, but we do hold it on many uh, programs. So we act as proxies, as a proxy for those developers who have entrusted us and asked us to help with making sure that the code that they've written with the intention of sharing it with the world uh, is actually always distributed, uh, always and forever, as free software. Um, for reports that we receive where we don't hold the copyright, uh, we will often reply and let the reporter know that. And um, uh, if we have a connection, we will put them in contact with the actual copyright holder of the copyleft software in question, and maybe that person is interested in following up on the report. So in addition to that, um, following up on actual violation reports, I would also include in our compliance work all of the time that we put into uh, work on materials that describe best practices, you know, things like the GPL FAQ, uh, all the materials on canoe.org slash licenses, and on fsf.org slash licenses. So even though uh, one of the most important principles that we follow when pursuing a violation report is beginning that conversation in private, as opposed to jumping to public shaming, uh, we, so we don't release or publish the names of the companies that we're talking to initially, uh, we do make sure to put a lot of effort into publishing the lessons that come out of each of those cases. You know, putting interpretations up on the site for scenarios that we've run into. We all know that the FAQ part of the GPL FAQ is a little bit misleading. Uh, it's not a short frequently asked questions list. It's actually a pretty comprehensive list of all the different kinds of questions that could come up and do come up. So we consider that part of our compliance work to try to inform uh, everyone out there and that way, hopefully, the two sides in any kind of dispute will have a common basis of interpretation to operate from. Uh, in addition to the confidentiality and, and the private approach I mentioned, we have several other principles that we follow whenever we do uh, enforcement work. And we recently published those principles uh, on FSF.org. There's an announcement about it in FSF.org slash news. And uh, we actually wrote that text with uh, Karen Sandler and Bradley Kuhn from the Software Freedom Conservancy. Also had help with Allison Randall from the Open Source Initiative. But the text itself is really a codification of the principles that the FSF has been following um, since 2001, I'm told at least. I know we've been following them since at least 2003. And I'm not going to read all of those. I hope you'll take a look. But um, just to sum them up, the, the goal of our compliance work is always to uh, fix, first of all, to assume good faith, assume that compliance issues are honest mistakes or misunderstanding. Uh, and the result that we're trying to achieve is a continued distribution of free software. We want to welcome participation by companies uh, even when they also distribute proprietary software. You know, we just want to make sure that the free software is distributed um, correctly. Uh, we don't do enforcement work for financial gain, uh, but we will request that our expenses uh, be reimbursed because we're a charity. Um, we have a charitable mission to promote free software, 
and so our charitable mission quite literally requires that we uh, ask for those expenses to be reimbursed as part of the service we provide and, and helping people uh, distribute free software correctly. We also don't accept payment for overlooking problems, uh, just to make that clear. Uh, neither the organization nor me personally. Uh, so it's, uh, we're always after the uh, end goal of protecting user freedom and enlarging the free software community. Uh, that being said, I, and we do want everybody to follow these principles when doing enforcement, but that being said, I think we also need to keep the fears about enforcement that's done even out of line with those principles in perspective. You know, I know that businesses involved in proprietary software deal with all sorts of risks of screwing up legal agreements, you know, from patent agreements to uh, copyright held by their competitors to uh, different kinds of one-off agreements that they make in order to distribute particular products. And, and the, the kinds of issues that you might run into with a free software license pale in comparison to those, really. Uh, and I also think everybody should keep in mind the kind of fears that the free world lives under uh, being sued for patent infringement being sued for copyright violations on proprietary software, being sued for EULA infractions on proprietary software. So when we're talking about the fears that people uh, have when they first begin to distribute free software about the licenses, let's make sure to keep uh, that whole broader picture in mind. And uh, I just want to end on, on, on the note that uh, I hope everyone sees compliance uh, for work for what it actually is, which is just a, a transition stage and some transition pains on the way to a world where we will all surely distribute all of our software as free, because that's the uh, quickest and easiest way to solve all compliance issues. Well, thank you. So the essence of copyleft, as you heard him say, is the protection of users' rights. And uh, we don't want money, we don't want publicity, all we want is compliance. We don't need more and we won't take less. So um, also, John mentioned the GNU free documentation license. Um, tiny piece of trivia I was written on Richard Stallman's mother's kitchen table. Evan and Richard wrote it. You will find uh, such gems hidden in these materials where Evan has an essay on uh, three decades of false legal strategy. Please take a look, flip through this, and there are other interesting stuff also. So I'll turn to you, Jim, now. So I'll start um, by saying we have obviously right. We obviously have a large group of developers developing both open, pure open source, and pure open source, purely proprietary products or mostly proprietary. Um, our practices have certainly evolved over time to help manage this. Um, I think. We've spent a lot of time on tooling and process, but uh, to be the my usual sort of designated contrarian here, um, I, I think what I would say is that I'm not sure that I would f f fairly characterize compliance as easy, or even that, um, or even that if we all were distributing entirely free software that the compliance problem would go away. Uh, because I spend personally a lot of my time uh, dealing with edge cases in compliance. Um, I guess I tend to think that, you know, we need to focus in terms of advancing compliance practice um, both on you know community norms and, and lawyers collaborating together we all talk about all this stuff um, but also on tooling uh, one one of the things that I believe um, is holding compliance uh, back sort of not non-trivially is that one, one of the patterns I'm seeing of late is the increasing use of open source and uh, advanced build tools, things like you know, Ant and Maven and other things, are facilitating people picking up very, very large volumes of code, um, often code that, you know, that they don't even necessarily know if they don't inspect very closely that they're using. And 
managing compliance uh, in, in that situation you know, requires effect, effective process that includes scanning all of your code. Um, and it, it's my take, uh, we're all spending a tremendous, tremendous amount of money and effort on code scanning tools um, and on compliance processes because the tooling for building using open source and using proprietary source, the, the tooling for builds is not really adequate in my perspective uh, to facilitate you know, the, the easy creation of, for example, you know, attribution documentation, right? Um, and, and one of the ways I'd sort of like to poke the community today is to think harder about this, that um, on the one hand, I, I don't think that the compliance problem is ever going to go away, right? Even if, we're all, even if we're all publishing free software, if I'm publishing my code under the CDL, and you know uh, somebody else wants to cut and paste that code into a you know piece of GPL code, right? There's always going to be uh, work by both engineers and lawyers required to figure out whether those cases, whether and when those cases are okay. I don't I don't think we'll, we'll get away from it unless we all move to the GPL v3 or a GPL v3. Um, so yeah. You, you, you clap. You clap now until I until I say Java's under the AGPL v3. Um, the <laughs> and that's my announcement for the day. Um, no. <laughs> exactly. Um, but I, I, I guess I just want to sort of turn our attention to the fact. I, I don't. I don't want us to be um, glib about saying. Compliance is easy because um, what, 20 years ago, right, um, the prevalence of third party IP, forget open source, the, the prevalence of third party proprietary IP even in our development processes was, you know, a trivial fraction of what it is now. And my fear is that our ability to develop process and technology around compliance process is not evolving nearly as fast as developer practices. And so, you know, what, what, worry, what keeps me up at night, so I, you know, I, have a, I have a legal function, but also a technical function uh, at, at Oracle. I, I help see to security policy and things like that. And what keeps me up at night is is seeing you know somebody picks up a p piece of code X, which when you recurse the dependency tree sucks in fifty other things, and we had, you know we have a, a license compliance issue that needs to be tracked down, but we also have you know old code, um, lots of unused, unexecuted code that gets sucked in because someone wanted a regular expression parser and they got it from Rhino, and now you have an old JavaScript engine in your product. Um, you, you, you wouldn't believe the things that I see day to day. And, and, and look, you know, Oracle has a lot of, um, a lot of genius developers. Um, I have 50,000 developers, so I, I'll let you do the mental math on whether they're all geniuses. Um, and, and, and on whether, please laugh. Um, and, and, on, and on whether they're all naturally inclined to, to follow a rigorous process, right? You're all, right so the, the question is, you know, so for, for some of you, you know, you're, you're going to have smaller teams, um, and, and maybe it's possible to impose uh, better oversight in a less uh, automated and systematic way. But when I got 50,000 people whose code I'm trying to oversee, right, I need tooling to facilitate this, and I tend to think of that same problem as applying, you know, outside an entity like Oracle as well in the broader community, in that, you know, if Jane developer, you know, picks up picks up item X and that picks up, you know, that recurses a tree of, of 50 other things, do we really think that 
you know, she is going to carefully police that? Do we think that their, their practices are actually involving that? I, I, based on my experience scanning code and seeing what's happening in the field, I actually don't believe that is occurring in, in all cases. Um, and, and consequently, uh, that, well, I, I, I think we're here maybe more to talk about enforcement than um, compliance, but, but, but I just want to, I just wanted to spend these few minutes to sort of redirect people's attention to the fact that this isn't actually a trivial problem. There are, there are non-trivial legal problems, but also non-trivial but solvable, eminently solvable technical problems um, that we should, that we as a community should be directing our attention to in order to facilitate, you know, my, you know, Oracle's compliance, but also, you know, Joe developer's compliance who's, you know, contributing to Project X or, or you know, want, wants to spin, you know, spin up his own little project. People don't have time or inclination to do this naturally, I think. I mean, we, you got a, a, right, a crew of lawyers, you know, and I'm, I'm counting you, um, <laughs> uh, sitting up here, right? So we're, we're naturally inclined toward this, this outcome, but I don't think that that translates well to the average developer being inclined to invest a lot of effort in this, and, and consequently, I think it's incumbent upon us to divert more energy to it. Well, great, code scanning tools coming too late in the process and not catching everything, but there's some self-assigned innovation. David Marr is leading the uh, Open Chain Working Group and LF. David, do you want to talk about that, and does that address some of what Jim has raised? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, Actually, before I talk about that, you know, just, you know, being with my fellow co-panelists, you know, there's, I just want to acknowledge that this, this has been a tremendous journey that we've been all been on. And, you know, I just want to thank, you know, Richard Stallman, but Evan Moglin in our audience here to, uh, for, for helping us sort of get here. Um, if you asked me seven years ago, I would have said, well, you know, our compliance issues are, you know, we're still dealing, dealing with it as an industry. But, but the reality is that, over the past seven years, we've actually made marked progress towards getting compliance done and getting it done better. I can't say well yet, okay, because there's still there's still more to, to go. Um, and I just, if I can just share, you know, how I got started. I was the I was a low man on the totem pole, okay. Somebody came into my office and said, uh, "We've got 75 open source reviews that have to get done. Somebody needs to look at this stuff." And you <laughs> have the least seniority, um, <laughs> and so, and so I, I, I mean, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was paper, okay? Actually, you know, write out a review, write out an analysis, take it to an executive, and have them ink a, pa a document to say, okay, we approve use of this thing. And um, I just thought it was, you know, I thought it was just in the beginning. I thought it was just really tough work, and it was. But I had no idea how, how intellectually interesting it would become. And, um, you know, so at, at this point, uh, 75 reviews is like nothing, okay? We don't do, no one, I don't think, any, I hope, is doing inked, you know, reviews. Uh, it's all gonna be through a portal, in, and it's at the volume of thousands, because that's how many uh, projects are actually getting pulled into uh, commercial products. Um, so I'd like to talk about, on the open chain piece, a problem that uh, may not be totally obvious to people. Um, in, a, in a sense, you might think of a product that you would go and purchase off the, the shelf at a local electronics store as something where a manufacturer pulled together a bunch of open source projects, wrote some perhaps uh, glue code or additional code, and made it, you know, maybe put it onto, you know, as firmware onto a hardware device and, and is now selling it, perhaps. It's not that easy. The reality is that in most commercial businesses, you have a nested supply chain. You have components that are sourced from different places. You have firmware that's written in a num number of different places. You have different optimizations to, uh, to existing drivers. You have uh, sometimes 
many layers of that supply chain and it cascades down and then ultimately it goes to someone that is trying to make money by selling it to someone who's going to buy it as an end user. So at that very end point in the chain, um, if you're given a bunch of components and you're told, okay, well, you know, um, I think that I used X, Y, and Z open source components in this software and maybe they'll pass you some uh, attribution information. Your problem is that since you actually don't know the engineering work that went into that, you don't know how to trust that. Which goes to the point that we were talking about earlier. Trust is a key part to actually making this ecosystem work. So um, how do you solve this? Well, unless, let's say I'm your supplier, unless you know my process, unless you know the assumptions I've made, um, you know, you don't, you don't know that even if I gave you a perfectly readable attribution file in this case, uh, how can you end up believing that you don't have to redo that work? Um, and that goes above and beyond, you know, the source code obligation requirements, the rights that, you know, Mishi mentioned that have to cascade downstream. So just as a practical matter, in order, in order for you to trust it, you have to make sure that, well, you know, you know, have I, do I have an open source policy? Do my engineers know about that policy? Is there a process? Do the engineers know to follow that process? Have they been trained on it? Um, does a, the process follow some basic uh, conformity steps? So open chain is an effort to try to draft together a, a set of uh, process conformance criteria where it, basically it would be um, all the things that a typical company has would have done to build out an open source process, these are all things that we are trying to build in. And we're actually, to be honest, we're not trying for the very, very best gold star version of, of ultimate compliance. We're trying to get people some nuts and bolts uh, steps in, the, in this stage so that they can figure out, okay, mechanically, what are the 12 steps I need to follow in order to get there? Um, and uh, so that's, that's ultimately what Open Chain is. Um, we're very grateful to the Linux Foundation for hosting this project. And uh, you know, we, uh, we would encourage, I think in the materials you have a, you have a link. If not, just, you know, we just Google Linux Foundation, Open Chain. Open Chain is one word. And uh, we look for people to get involved. Uh, we do all our work on a Wikimedia etherpad. So you know, on our calls, we just basically have people just write what they think the right edits are. And if you write an edit offline, outside of a call, we ask that you join the next call so that you can explain, you know, your proposal and we can debate that. And uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with version one of that specification for, if we can, later this year. So that's, that's open chain. Add one point there. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank David for getting this, this started because we've tried other times to have this kind of collaboration around processes and, you know, it's your personal commitment and approaching people that's made this work and I just want to say thank you for that because that really is what makes it happen but but I the um, the value here is that going one by one by one with different processes to those vendors the vendors have said we can't do this six different ways for everybody and therefore we won't do anything um, the value of having everyone work together and give a, a coherent guidance to the vendors is that they they, one, don't have any excuse, and two, because it really bakes into their process for everyone, it up, you know, ups the, the, uh, the uh, likelihood that it's all going to work. And, and so that, you know, the cross-industry collaboration is absolutely key to what, you know, David and the Open Chain are working on. It's absolutely key, and it only happens because those, all of us have begun to work together as opposed to having these independent processes that we think of as individual assets. And the other thing that I think David's done an excellent job on, and you talked about starting one place, oftentimes the reason we haven't been able to get things off the ground is because, you know, people have looked for something that was perfect and said, you know, this is what we need. And what we, what we really need is to take people on this path where they get started. You know, Eben's been talking about for a long time, you know, step one is just basic education. Can we start there and not start at code scanning, you know? Um, but how, how do we begin someplace 
and make it feel like a concrete beginning and then take a step and get better and get better and get better. And because I think some people in their reaction to open chain is it isn't going to be enough. Well, it isn't going to be enough in its first version. Nobody's, nobody's talking about it. But it is a concrete step that can be, it, that if we take it together, will actually have an impact on the way the vendors operate. And I just wanted to say thanks because I don't think we would be anywhere near where we are without your leadership. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I, I don't know how to reciprocate. <laughs> Those are very kind words. But um, uh, so we're coming out with version one and then version version two. By the way, version one is going to be self-authentication, okay, self-certification, if you will. Um, and then version two, we're actually hoping to actually have the option to have third-party verification in place. So there's, there, you know, please, uh, please look for more. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Richard now occupies a very special place. He's been on this side because he was, he is a distinguished alum. It was at SFLC and now is at Red Hat, another very interesting and different company profile from the rest of uh, people here. I want you to talk about this now. Yeah. Um, so first, it's, it's really, um, personally for me, it's great to be here. Um, I was at the ancestral event, I guess, the ancestral event in 2007, and um, I don't know if it was in this room, but it was in a similar room at least. And uh, so it's, it's kind of uh, moving for me to be back here. Um, so I, I'm going to talk about, in, in the context of this, this topic, I'm going to talk about, about Red Hat, of course, because we're talking about the organizations we're at. Um, and Red Hat, you know, it's, it, I don't know how much people know about Red Hat, um, but uh, Red Hat's relationship with open source and free software is really um, unique and pervasive and unusual. And that affects a lot of how Red Hat looks at the kinds of issues that I think uh, most of us um, on this panel are thinking of as um, compliance or, or enforcement. Um, first of all, Red Hat uh, it did not start out as a proprietary technology company. It started out, it came out of the free software movement. It came out of the Linux project community. Um, like a number of um, other s startups in the 1990s, it came out of the Linux community. Um, so that's one thing that's very different. It, its employees um, at the earliest strata, stratum of the company came out of a very GPL-oriented um, culture. Uh, and um, so that's, that's one thing. That's the roots of the company. The, the company also um, has evolved a software development methodology that is, uh, I think, fairly unique in the industry. It, it emphasizes the um, use of public, uh, very transparent, open source development at the earliest stages. Essentially, open source development is, is the earliest stages of product development for most of the, the commercial products coming out of Red Hat. So when Red Hat starts a major open source project, in, in most cases historically, there has been um, a corresponding uh, project set up by Red Hat uh, in the community upstream that um, represents the earliest work on that project, on that product, which uh, is, is later refined at a much later stage um, internally at Red Hat. So, so the um, initial stages of product development at Red Hat are uh, project development, and that's that's another difference. So, so soft, so open source software development is part of the the natural software development methodology at Red Hat, uh, and and it's 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 very much um, uh, it, it's it's a, a open source in the methodological sense, it's not simply in the licensing sense. So, so these are projects that operate um, publicly and transparently. It's not just like they, they do, we do, there are some companies that do, that still do, um, um, and projects that do, do open source and free software development largely internally and then occasionally um, release code and some of, some of those projects are pretty well known. Red Hat does not do this. Um, so, so that's another difference. Uh, another difference uh, and, and another way that Red Hat is unusual in the way that open source uh, uh, influences uh, the company is how we distribute and license and release our products. The products are, um, in a sense, presented and conceptualized and licensed largely um, as open source products. I, I, 
I'm, I don't personally like that term so much, but, but it, it, it tries to capture the truth, which is that that the you know the the overarching software license of these products, um, the distributed products, um, is it, it will reference an open source license, typically the GPL, which is you know we have these EULAs that say you know you're granted a license. Um, under the GPL. It's not a proprietary license with a clause that says, oh, but there's some open source in here and um, the open source is, is exceptional. Um, so that's, that's another issue. Um, as part of that strategy also, we, we have um, always, um, for these kinds of products, provided source code for those um, components that we received as open source upstream or that we develop in Project Upstream. So we're providing source code, uh, substantial amounts of source code um, corresponding to these products to our customers. We're not just providing binaries. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, pretty important is that open source has more broadly influenced the culture of Red Hat. Uh, so um, in, in all sorts of ways, um, I, there's a book written by our CEO, Jim Whitehurst, called The Open Organization that really gets a lot of this uh, right. I was actually, um, I, I had only read part of it, uh, but I was finishing it up on the bus down here. And it's really, I'm amazed at how a CEO can get um, the things that I have seen over the years um, really so perfectly. He, he's not, obviously he's not a developer. He's pretty far removed in a way from the details of what the engineers do at Red Hat. But he gets the, the culture down exactly in the ways that, that open source culture and ideology has influenced um, the way um, employees at Red Hat, both in an engineering function and in other functions as well, are, are um, influenced by the values that come out of open source. And so all of that, I mention all of that because it, it, it influences the way that Red Hat approaches the kinds of issues that I think we are talking about as, as compliance. We, we don't really talk about um, compliance. We don't use that term so much in the open source context at Red Hat because it's sort of like the, the issues that we're usually talking about when we think of compliance um, are, are ones that we have solved naturally through our um, development and distribution methodology. So um, we, when we release Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we're, we're also providing our customers with um, the source packages for all of those thousands of open source licensed packages, whether they're copyleft or non-copyleft, the, they're all, the, the license upstream is passed through, the changes that Red Hat makes are provided um, in source code form and are provided under the open source license that the upstream project use. And so the, a lot of the issues that I think many companies have struggled with, um, companies that come from a more proprietary uh, heritage, are ones that, that we have, have not um, really had to face. And so in, in, in that sense, the basic forms of uh, what, what, what many of us might think of as compliance um, source code compliance, making sure you're providing with the source code obligations of copyleft licenses. Uh, uh, that, that is something that we do as a matter of course. And, and uh, it's not that we, we ignore the issue or are not conscious of the issue, but it's, it's a side effect of the way we naturally, uh, it's a side effect of our engineering process and our productization process. And therefore it's sort of a, um, when I think of all the free software and open source legal issues that I deal with at Red Hat, it's in a way a, a kind of secondary issue for the most part. Um, one effect of that is that, that we, the kinds of issues that we deal with that involve um, application and interpretation of free software and open source licenses are uh, more complex in nature and more, I, I find them more intellectually interesting in nature. They, they may have to do with, um, um, so I'll, I'll think of some, some, uh, some historically well-known examples. In 2002, Red Hat changed its business model. It created an enterprise server product, um, and uh, it stopped shipping a um, box consumer product uh, and, and stopped providing uh, binaries uh, to the general public for, uh, for, for that product. And that was a, a big deal. Red Hat got a lot of heat for it. It was uh, many years before I... Uh, came to Red Hat, but um, but you know for for a change like that, you can you can bet that that um, the legal team at Red Hat at the time and and really the whole company was very engaged in and asking themselves, you know, are um, how does this relate to the GPL? The GPL is our our dominant license. Our our suppliers are our GPL licensors. We ourselves are GPL licensors. How does this this um, business model change? 
map to what the GPL requires us to do. It's taken, uh, things like that are taken with a high degree of seriousness. They, they don't involve the, the kind of what I think of as more rote issues of, of um, source code compliance. They involve um, much more um, intricate issues of, of, of structuring business models and, and contracts that are overlaid upon distribution of, of um, open source and free software. Um, I think also of something else that happened several years ago, it's also well known, uh, Red Hat entered uh, into a settlement with a, a patent troll um, in the Firestar case, uh, and, and it was um, something that was really a landmark thing at the time, Red Hat uh, uh, crafted a settlement agreement um, which was um, designed uh, to be uh, GPLv2 compliant, GPLv3 compliant, GPLv3 was a new license at the time. This was a big deal for Red Hat. There were people who were saying, well, you can't, um, you, you can't have a patent settlement that's compliant with GPLv3. Red Hat was very engaged in making sure that it, it um, structured a patent settlement agreement that was compliant with GPLv3. Another example of how uh, on these very um, um, important um, actions by Red Hat, uh, GPL compliance is taken very seriously by all um, levels of the company. Everyone in the legal team, um, our uh, Michael Cunningham, our general counsel, who is the most knowledgeable uh, GC on open source issues, is in the audience there, and and he's uh, as engaged as anyone else on the the legal team on on these kinds of issues. Um, and so it's a different kind of atmosphere, I think, than may exist in in other kinds of of IT companies. So so that's that's that's. One part of it, you know, another thing is the, the effect of the, the culture is that we, we, our employees are very, they see um, playing by the rules um, in open source, um, particularly around the GPL, but, but also more generally, is, is something that they, they see as a, as a fundamental issue of corporate ethics. And uh, it's something that's very important to them personally. Also, bear in mind that many of them our, are our upstream copyright holders and upstream licensors because we employ many of the key developers on the projects that we we depend on. So so we have employees who are watching over the whole company and watching over each other and keeping everyone um, in check. And and so as as a matter of ethics, uh, we are we are dedicated to to um, playing by the rules and doing the right thing and actually really doing more than we think that we're required to do. We we don't have to provide all that source code. Um, for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, uh, because it's not all under copyleft licenses, but we choose to do so because we feel it's the right thing to do for uh, matters of culture and corporate corporate ethics and corporate ideology. Uh, our, our brand is built around open source uh, development, and and so so we go um, more we we go a ways longer than than we really have to in in uh, setting an example. Um, we also, um, a key thing for, for Red Hat, I think maybe the, the most important thing I would emphasize is that we develop and have very close productive relationships with um, upstream, the upstream projects that we, we um, depend on and use in our products. We have personal relationships. I mean, I mentioned that we, we employ some of the, some of the developers, um, but, but it's more than that. Even when we, we don't employ them, um, our developers um, are interacting with them all the time. That's the kind of um, engineering employee that we will hire. I will also say of myself that I have made an effort to make myself, you know, known to this community, this technical community of developers from various kinds of project communities and project cultures. They know who I am. I've developed friendships with them and and collegial relationships with them. That is um, extremely important in creating a, a um, tone of uh, and, and relationship that's based on trust uh, and and building credibility um, and uh, so it, it's it, you know we don't really find ourselves in a lot of difficult conflict situations at least not ones that we we can't anticipate and resolve um, at a very early stage because we we emphasize uh, uh, building those relationships so much so so um, an example is Simo uh, is is uh, well, actually, I think license compliance uh, officer for Samba's, uh, also a key Samba developer. Samba's a very important project, GPLv3 project, uh, um, that is included in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And Simo, you know, Simo is, is a developer on the project. He works at Red Hat and has worked at Red Hat for many years, and he does, uh, he works on other things at Red Hat. 
but I know because I know Simo and, and he's a friend of mine and, and he works at Red Hat, if he thinks that Red Hat is, is doing the slightest thing wrong around Samba, he will let us know right away and we will, we will work with him and we will fix it. And, and I don't think it would get to that stage, but, but it, that's partly because you know, he's, he's, he's one of us and we're, we're part of his project community. So, so it's not, um, we don't conceptualize uh, our relationship with upstream as us versus them. We're, we're participants, mm -hmm. we're collaborators, and that has, that has a big effect on how we view these kinds of issues. Um, one further effect of that is that we, we are not mere, um, we're not merely reactive to these issues. We are actively engaged um, in communicating with upstream communities and more generally in the legal community as well. But we're actively engaged in trying to, to shape the law, I would say, the law around open source um, and, and really kind of move it in, in certain directions. I, the way I would describe it is we, we, um, we're very committed to um, there being a robust landscape of different policies in, in open source licensing from strong copyleft to weak copyleft to um, permissive, and each of those is appropriate in particular circumstances. Um, but but we, um, within that framework, we are often trying to promote what I would say is liberal, business-friendly interpretations of specific issues of, for example, GPL interpretation, although it goes beyond GPL interpretation. And we believe that's very important. It's important for our customers, but it's important also to the, for the larger open source ecosystem. We don't, I see a certain problem of, of excessive um, rigidity and literalness and pedanticness in the way um, these kinds of issues are um, addressed uh, uh, in the legal community as well as in upstream development communities. And it's, I, I don't think that's a good thing. And, and so we've tried to really um, push things in, in that liberal direction and uh, I, I think we have the, we've built up the credibility and uh, uh, respect with those communities for years that enables us to do that effectively. The, the one further thing I would say is um, we do face challenges. Um, so w when Jim was talking about um, Maven, and I, I totally get what he means. But, so, um, Red Hat started out as a Linux company, but it's, it's grown up the stack while remaining an open source oriented company. Um, Red Hat acquired JBoss uh, 10 or so, uh, eight, eight or nine years ago. JBoss is a very different kind of um, uh, open source ecosystem. It's a Java-oriented ecosystem. Um, Maven, Maven, Maven may not have existed at the time that we acquired uh, JBoss, but, but Maven is a dominant build uh, methodology. Now, so they, I know exactly what Jim's talking about. Um, Java, enterprise Java software, Java libraries, Java products are using a, a methodology of development that's very different from what's been established at the Linux level. And it presents um, different kinds of um, challenges in terms of how to deal with, um, uh, um, you know, what, what might be called compliance issues, you know, compliance issues, doing the, making sure we're doing the right things around around the licenses that we're using. And, and, and I should also say, by the way, that, you know, because we are the, the licensors of many of these components, we are actually thinking of this as a, a matter of self-compliance. I don't know if, if Oracle does as well with, with um, you know, OpenJDK and, and MySQL, but, but, but we're, it's not an issue of um, compliance or, or enforcement risk. We're the ones who are the, who are the licensors, but we're thinking, well, what is the best way of um, interpreting the GPL for ourselves and imposing, in a sense, imposing these obligations on ourselves? What is the best policy for um, that particular project and for the larger uh, Ecosystem. So there are some challenges as Red Hat has gotten bigger, as it's grown by acquisition. We have developers coming from very different kinds of um, developer backgrounds. This is similar to what Jim's talking about. I think uh, uh, they have different levels of experience. That's the biggest challenge I've seen in education, really, um, and integration uh, is, is the key. And, and I think we're fortunate in having this baseline Linux culture that, that influences and, and, in a sense, educates the, the newer people at the company into learning um, what, uh, you know, what, what good uh, open source development practices are all about. And those development practices tend to lead to good legal practices as well. Okay, thank you. We've heard when suits become cooler, things get better. So, uh, and also the company's relationships with upstream FOSS projects, how it contributes to a good compliance profile. Um, I heard all of you almost say that Compliance has two elements. There's a software governance element, which is within the corporation, 
the process by which the businesses document and control what software they take in, they distribute, what license terms are offered on those inbound, outbound transactions, and the other part of it, which is enforcement, and which um, has uh, the important element of trust um, and education are the two uh, themes running through this. So um, that's a that's a good segue to the next thing where I want to take the conversation maybe is that what in your view are compliance efforts intended for? Um, and what is the importance of uh, skilled, facilitated communication uh, between parties, transparency or education in these efforts? And I just let all of you talk about it. So whoever wants to go first. I think there are a couple of things you get out of c compliance, but I'm going to go back to the issue a lot of people have talked about. Uh, I th as I said, I, it's not just a legal obligation. It's clearly if you don't want to get in trouble with your product, um, you want to follow the terms of the license, uh, you, you have an obligation to do that. Uh, the same way if you have a proprietary software uh, provided to you, you need to follow the terms, whatever license you get under. It's just no way around that. I mean, one of the arg arguments I often have with my own developers is that we need to know what's in there so I can com comply with whatever you've signed me up to. And if I don't know, I can't do that. And that actually becomes a problem with when you get these giant projects um, that Jim was talking about. Like, we spend a month clearing certain projects, like Chef, for example. It just goes on forever and ever and ever. But I think the other, other real thing you get out of compliance, and I, I really think this is extremely important, is you get credibility. Um, if you can establish to the various communities that you know, you're working with them as opposed to against them, um, there is, you, just, you, you do um, encourage a sort of trusting relation. And I also kind of think, and, and this is a little bit uh, perhaps selfish, is that when you do make a mistake, and you will make a mistake. I mean, it, it, it's, you've got th tens of thousands of packages to worry about easily. Uh, and if some, when somebody says you've made a mistake, the initial reaction is going to be, let's talk about it, how can we fix it, as opposed to I'm shutting you down. And uh, that's very important. I think it's important for everyone. I think it helps the communities to prosper, and it helps the companies using the code to prosper. So that's really what I think you get out of compliance. You follow your legal obligations, but you also build um, a relationship of trust, which in fact helps the community to prosper and you. So it's a good symbiotic relationship. To build upon that, I think the relationship piece, which you just alluded to and also Richard alluded to, I think is critically important here. Um, it, it's interesting because I mentioned earlier Martin Fink, who's our CTO at HP, uh, and he was our first VP of open source. He also wrote a book on open source, The Business and Economics of Linux and Open Source. And he wrote this book back in 2003. I read it at the time, and I think the thing that resonated with me most was the fact that he kind of harped on the importance of relationships in the open source community. And as a lawyer, you know, a young lawyer at the time um, working in open source, I viewed relationships as important in the legal community overall. But I fully understood, and it resonated with me, the importance of relationships in open source. It's so much more important, I think, in open source legal work than elsewhere. And I think the relationships are important not only amongst the lawyers, and we do have, you guys, we have unique working relationships amongst ourselves and amongst our, the, the legal community at large. I think it's really, it, it's one thing I do love about working in open source. Um, I think the other thing is the relationship piece is so important with the community. And to build upon the, the things that were said earlier, we HP, we also employ a lot of developers who work in open source. And they work in open source and they contribute everything back to open source. So we're helping the community. But part of that is, is the, the, again, the relationship piece and how it ties into compliance is, you know, if you build those relationships, those relationships of trust, those relationships of, you know, look, we're credible here. We, we are, you know, working in this together. We're all in this together. And the compliance is not just a legal issue. And it's, it's, it's a broader issue than that. It's an issue with developers. It's an issue with that community at large. And to your point as well around communication, it's also important because, you know, I, I 
worked at a number of companies, and I've also talked to my colleagues about this, you will get hit with questions about compliance. Are you complying with this? You'll get, you'll get inquiries. And it's important when you have those to make sure you have the right folks engaged initially and pull together quickly to have, you know, someone from the technical side take a look at it, someone from legal to take a look at it, someone from the community aspect. I mean, all of those things are multifaceted and so critically important in compliance. So I think that's the, the thing that really resonates with me here. You first, Dave. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with all those comments. And I would just say that, uh, you know, one of the things that are probably worth defudding right now, though, is there was some years ago, there was this false perception that enforcement was happening in a sort of an uncontrolled way, you know, and the behavior of those who chose to enforce, actually, the track record has been actually these people have been really motivated by very clear objectives, okay? And those objectives, um, they've been very transparent about, and they've been consistent. And at this point, I think the reason to fear uh, sort of this notion that, oh, open source is scary, um, the GPL is scary, uh, those are passe. I think that most companies are well past that. Um, and I think that uh, you know, just being agile and responsive, try to get it perfect, just try to get it well done. Um, know that because it's complex, you know, to some of the comments earlier, um, you know, there's going to be sometimes a mistake made. But the most important rule is that when, when, when Mishi or John or Evan calls you, take the call. <laughs> so um, I, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll start with, with a little contrarianism again. Um, surprise, surprise. And, and say, you know, I, I, I wouldn't presume, you know, the arrogance of being able to say what compliance is intended for, what enforcement is intended for, right? We, we live in a, in a society in which people are free to create intellectual property and enforce it as they like. So I, you know, I, I can't say, I, 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 I wouldn't take it upon myself, you know, notwithstanding any sort of natural communitarian inclinations about open source to say that Joe or Jane developer should or shouldn't be enforcing for any particular reason, um, it, however uncomfortable or, or it may be for, for us. Um, you know, that said, I do think that transparency, you know, going back to the, going back to the trust point, um, and, and also going back to the, the point earlier from earlier about you know any trickiness with compliance on, on difficult issues um, the willingness to be out front about interpretations of the licenses um, in so maybe I'm an idiot but I don't, I think, I, I face questions regularly uh, which which in my mind are not open and shut. And the ability to get, you know, a, qu a quick handle on what, what each licensor thinks, I think, uh, is is critical for, for trust building and sort of uh, norm setting. I also kind of think uh, that you know, we shouldn't be afraid to innovate in this regard. You know, that, that like sticking with the license, sticking with a particular interpretation of the license, um, because that's historical, um, or, or, you know, adding an, you know, adding a new, ex a, cl a clear exception to the license. Or I guess one of the things that I, that I run into the, the, you know, as as Richard said, you know, the the sort of mechanical ones tend to be easier. You know, with respect to providing source and all that stuff. But when when you face you know sort of more complicated issues, um, I t I tend to think that uh, perhaps having having discussions in the open about what licenses mean. Um, with with you know between participants, copyright holders, users, 
and and also, if necessary, changing things, right? I mean, so I, I was talking earlier, and I, I, I want to hand, hand away the mic here, but um, I was talking earlier about the importance of investing in tooling, right, going forward. But I also think that in open source, licenses are tooling. We shouldn't be shying away from innovating to, you know, if necessary, to solve some of these problems. So I was just going to say that um, it's important not to overly uh, mythologize the, or simple, oversimplify this kind of issue. Uh, and I thought maybe something you were saying was hinting at that. So um, the way I'm, I, I'm just, forgive me, but the way I think of it is when I look at Jim, I don't see Richard Stallman. And it's kind of, a, you know, that, that's, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll grow it out. I'll, I'll grow it out. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so we have, I mean, I mean so, so Oracle is an important uh, GPL licensor of Red Hat. Um, Free Software Foundation is a very important free software license. These are these are different organizations um, with different interpretations and expectations and um, you know objectives. And uh, so I'm often thinking about that issue. What is the identity of the licensor? What is you know what are they expecting? What are they looking for? What is what is Red Hat's objective and all that? What is Red Hat's relationship with Oracle and with the FSF? And and just just two examples, but it's, it's really all it's very complex because we have a uh, a complex ecosystem with um, by design. We have we have multiple licensors from very different projects. Sometimes even within the same project, we have multiple licensors, multiple copyright holders, with um, maybe differing interpretations. That's certainly true of the Linux kernel. Uh, and and that can make it challenging. So you're right that that compliance is not necessarily uh, easy or simple in all cases uh, because we have uh, we have these different interpretations and, and debating viewpoints and and conflicting viewpoints and um, we we want to take that into account. Uh, there are different motivations. So so for uh, actors that are engaged in enforcement, um, some of the motivations are are idealistic. Some of them may not be idealistic. Um, those are things that we, um, that certainly I think about and take into account when I'm looking at, at a particular situation. Another thing which I, I think also um, picks up from what Jim was talking about, although I may have a different take on it than you, is that, that I, I meant just to say it before, the, um, when I was saying that, that you know, we, we focus a lot of tension on, uh, attention on, on building these relationships upstream, I would also say that, that we, we um, I try to like really to the extent possible, and this isn't always going to be appropriate or possible, but I try to move um, resolution of open source free software related legal issues upstream. And by that I mean, I don't just mean like doing it early rather than later because you know, remember I described Red Hat's model begins with this upstream element. I mean that, that it's much um, less contentious to work out a, an issue and clarify an issue of differing interpretation of a license within a, a community project where you're maybe a participant, maybe you're one of many participants, maybe you're just a minority contributor of a patch. And it's much um, easier and I think more, more productive to do it at this stage at which the developers are, are open source, free software developers, rather than some company developing something internally and consuming their software, maybe indirectly. Um, that, that doing that um, relatively publicly can be very advantageous in lowering um, any sense of uh, risk around that activity. That, that's not going to be possible or appropriate in all situations, um, but I think that that's something that, that doesn't come naturally to, to many lawyers, but it's, it's been a theme of the way I have approached this kind of work, and I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's worked very well. I, I also think that, um, you know, I, th I do think it's great that we, we now have this legal community that in some ways I think has been very influenced by, um, you know, in a sort of distorted way, uh, by the culture of the of the open source development communities that they are watching and thinking about, um, but but it's important not to. Um, I, I see some danger of us lawyers who do a lot of work around open source getting together and and kind of developing this sort of isolated echo chamber thing, uh, at where we we don't actually also bring in the developers, and and I don't mean just. Um, uh, uh, representatives of community organizations like the FSF, so like John and Evan and, and Mishi, but also SEMA, a um, uh, SAMA developer, or or um, any of the various um, Linux kernel developers. And 
and you know, name, name your community project where you have a lot of, um, especially where developers are clearly um, idealistically motivated, um, like developing um, communication paths with those developers, um, not necessarily their legal counsel alone, but also the developers themselves is incredibly valuable. Well, thank you. The sign of a good conversation is that you spill over and 90 minutes is not enough. And I don't want to cut anybody off, but there hopefully will be hallway conversations. And um, I would really like to take at least one or two questions. I know there isn't much time. So um, there is Keith Bergelt and from OIN. And Thanks. I wanted to pick up where uh, Richard left off, and I, I agree with you know so much of what's said. The the level of collaboration the, it me really mirrors what you find in the developer community, and that's great because it should. And I think we've come. You know, I've just watched in the last eight years, and I, my first introduction to uh, to open source really was spending time at the event uh, in 07 that uh, Richard referenced at the beginning of his remarks, and. Uh, I've seen this growth on on kind of patent on aggression, obviously that we're involved in on a regular basis, and and on the copyright side and enforcement and the sense of governance starting to emerge. I think when we we've had the great benefit of having a culture of copyright owners that have not been seeking to to I think John's earlier point not seeking as kind of following the FSF model, not seeking anything but uh, that you get back in compliance and that you do it in a reasonable time frame. And I think if you look at uh, GPL3, that time frame, there's a lot more accommodation of the fact that you may be locked into producing product and you need some time to kind of unwind to be able to get back in compliance. And I think over time, the GPL has responded to practical realities. One of the problems I have is that I think we're looking at you know, some of the things Dave's doing and, and SPDX and all these measures designed to improve our ability to maintain compliance. But yet when I talk to companies and, and I talk to Linus and people in the, in the tab and whatnot, the, we're really not there. I think we've got significant issues and I think this is not something that we want to not address. I think. The, the problem is right now is while we still have significant issues and we're looking to address them, and we're getting better, to Dave's point, the problem is that the culture is starting to shift. There are fracturings, uh, uh, fissures that are occurring in what the traditional culture is that, that RMS and, and John have been promulgating. Uh, and we're seeing people now looking at financial gain. I think there's no other conclusion in the McCarty case. When someone's harvested it conservatively $2 million plus in revenue uh, related to 50 plus pre-litigation assertions and litigation-based assertions uh, on the copyright side, we are now at a critical point where we need to come together to be able to attempt to create a community solution to deal with what I would say is a, a loss of cultural unity. Uh, because if it happens here, it will set an example. Uh, for others and what I'm afraid of is that we're going to start to see it's not just about good uh, uh, Good compliance management and it's it goes beyond that It's it's us as the the kind of the legal stewards of, of the protectors and guardians of Kind of a way of life, which is really what I've always seen this as it's a way of creating new value and 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 changing the way that that innovation occurs in society globally that we have this, I think, responsibility to, to move more quickly and to work more closely, uh, even though we do collaborate in unprecedented levels. I think we need to be more unified, and it's all the people who are doing enforcement, all the people who are doing compliance, compliance internally, the developer community, and we need to be able to communicate effectively that the cultural norm that has existed from the beginning around copyright utilization has to be maintained. We need to hold the line. And that as a result, we need to kind of look at this situation with McCarty as a total aberration and not one that's going to, going to be, become a potential trend. Because 
what I, I said in, in Barcelona to many of you in April is that I can see a world where we have individuals who are antagonistic toward Linux and toward open source and that model because I, I do think we still have a number of companies, even though we have incredible participation, we do have a, uh, an undercurrent of inauthenticity that still exists within companies where that culture that, that Red Hat has is not prevalent across the board. And all of you are, have been attempting to drive that down into your organizations, but sometimes I know that you feel a little bit like a frogman trying to push on the rudder of the Titanic. <laughs> You're not going to get it to move, but you've been working real hard to try to do that. Sometimes it's just critical mass, it's attention to the CEO, it's changing the cultures of an organization, but you're judged by everything you do. Uh, every organization you participate in, every activity you're involved in, how authentic are you and, and how much does, does compliance matter inside your companies. I think in many companies that needs to change and we need, we need to become more authentic. And, and at a base level, we need to be able to now rise up to be able to deal with this, this potential erosion in one of the, the fundamental tenets of, of what this community is about uh, and deal with it head on rather than, you know, we've gone through two years of dealing with McCarty and we've accomplished very little, if anything. In fact, we fed the beast because he's had over 40 settlements during that time. And so we at OIN and, and our board members are very concerned about this and, and want to work collaboratively with you and, and others uh, that are in the various legal communities around open source to ensure that this that we're not here a year from now and still facing this issue with no no end in sight. That's a, that's two great that's many great points. One of course is the change from automatic termination in GPL v2 to section 8 termination clause in v3 which gives more time for self-curing. But the important point is that many people are coming to the cool party then what costumes you're wearing and what intentions are, it's not easy to decipher. And that is what Keith is saying is, I believe, um, what's going on and there are certain principles or norms, not only great technical stuff, but social legal norms which have helped build the community and uh, are we at a point where we're losing? But what I want right now is that from each of you to summarize, at least give me two most important things you think which are important to make sure that the community moves in the right direction and we keep making better software. Yeah, Starting if I can just follow, a follow up because I absolutely, and when where I started, so I'm going to go back to where I started, is that when you look through this whole story, you know, there was a guided process that drove us towards the adoption that we have of commercial companies. And we will be, um, it's very uh, sad if we don't recognize that that process is not over. That we are still, we are only actually beginning to get adoption in new industries and new companies and, and that that process of guiding them towards confidence in the use of free software, we're not done. We're only halfway through. And unlike, you know, proprietary licenses might, might be much scarier and harder and everything else, but you know, we have, we have this license and this, or this group of licenses and this community and undermining confidence in this license, no matter where the action is, affects that adoption process. We are all in a community because that next company, that next industry, that next, you know, place where free software could be used is affected by what we do in, you know, this community and every enforcement action has an impact on adoption. And if we do not understand that, we have really forgotten where we came from. Because if we had not been so carefully guided, we would not be here in terms of all of these commercial companies using free software. So that, that's one point. And then the other point that, that Keith is making is that there are, there are not only people outside the community in terms of compliance, but you know, we have at least one very serious example of somebody who's outside the community interests in terms of enforcement. And we all will pay a price for that, which is why, you know, we need to maintain this close conversation. So, I think, uh, so I can't really speak to the, the details of, of some of those specific uh, cases, I'm uh, not being familiar with them, but I, I know that it reminds me of what we've just, just been through with security in the free software world and, and the recognition that 
while a lot of companies are, de are depending on software that is maintained uh, with not very many resources by not very many people, and when there's problems in that software, big issues happen. And, and kind of what I'm hearing is that, that people wish there were more organizations uh, steering the culture in this context uh, towards you know, keeping it focused on the version of the culture that these successful businesses have sprung out of distributing free software. And so I think that if we want to keep things that way, that uh, just like a bunch of companies came together and invested money to support the free software that their security and their products depend on, I think that we can see uh, enforcement and compliance and licensing work in a similar way. And of course, you know, I hope that means that people will support the FSF in the way that we do that work, but I don't think we can be the only organization doing that work by any means. I think that this is a need for more organizations to pop up doing enforcement work uh, according to the kinds of principles that we outlined and for those organizations to actually be supported uh, and not, you know, we're a 501c3 charity, we, we do okay, we're sustainable, but uh, as this world grows, you know, we're going to need more organizations, we're going to need, everybody's going to need more resources in order to keep the culture focused in a positive uh, and constructive fashion in this area, just like in areas of technical security. Um, and the other quick point I want to close on is that uh, the one thing I always wish in our compliance work is that we had a way to talk about it publicly after the fact. Um, because we want to deal with these cases you know, privately and confidentially, uh, the best thing I can do to talk about our work is to stand up and say, we resolved 12 cases last year. You know, and maybe I can talk about the kinds of violations that there were, but I can't talk about the companies or the significance of the cases very easily because that works against our desire to have those conversations be in private. And so, I hope people can help brainstorm, you know, ways that uh, companies who made a mistake and corrected it can be comfortable talking about that uh, publicly after the fact, because I think that can also help um, mitigate some of the fear and uncertainty about using free licenses and copyleft licenses in particular. If specific people can stand up and say, uh, we made a mistake, we corrected it, there was no disaster, everything's good now. I think that would really, and that, I would love that because as an executive director of a nonprofit, I could talk much more persuasively and specifically uh, about the work that we spend so much of our time and resources on. Just in the interest of time, uh, may I just request you to be brief? Sure. <laughs> um, but so I hope the conversation will go on, and I'm looking forward to it, but everybody keeps showing me these time sheets every <laughs> So, and giving me those really bad looks, so okay. I'm just <laughs> So just uh, quickly then, um, what we've seen, what I've personally seen over the last 15 years, at least from my, from my participation, is uh, diversity, a really diversity. There, there's not just one sort, we know, there's, there's multiple communities with different philosophies, and that's, that's great. I think that's good. I think that's wonderful, actually. Um, what I worry about is the bad actors. There are, because whenever you, your community grows that large, you're going to attract trolls, people whose intentions are not the same. I think many of us, many of us if not all of us here, are kind of guardians in a sense uh, of certain portions, certain aspects of what has become a kind of a new universe. And it is up to us to kind of discourage the bad actors. Every society has them and every society needs to deal with them, and I think we're probably stronger together on this than we are individually, so I'll keep it there. Okay, so I'll keep it brief. Um, I just want to make two points. One is around, really, communication, and that's the, you know, modeling after the open source ecosystem and making sure we have, I think to Jim's point earlier, let's have an open communication, let's have an open dialogue about CDDL and, and GPLv2 and the, you know, let's have that conversation in the, in the open and let's include not only lawyers in that communication but also let's include the developers, let's include, you know, that let's have that open dialogue around those kinds of issues um, and try to get ahead of those kinds of issues as well. And then the second point is, you know, we're all ambassadors for what we're doing within our respective organizations. So continue to keep the dialogue open, continue to train, to educate, to, um, and also recognize that training and education evolves over time. So keep engaged, heavily engaged with those communities in which you participate and make sure you're adjusting um, your education program to fit that as well. Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm hearing to, from themes from today is basically we have this nest of interdependencies um, 
just like you know how good software is created in open source. It's these interdependent. You know, good code leads to better code. But on the compliance side, we've we've heard that you know bad compliance leads to bad compliance. We know that <laughs> you can't get better at it, right? You know, when someone starts with something bad, you can you, you can't fix it and on the compliance side very easily because you don't know what's in it. Uh, good compliance, however, can lead to better compliance. We've seen that on the enforcement side, um, good transparent enforcement leads to good community behavior um, and a re reduced overall need um, over, as a trend for more enforcement. But we've also, I think this sort of this conversation right now is about uh, perhaps bad enforcement uh, as something that we don't want to see uh, uh, persist. So Very quick. just um, maybe repeating some themes I've said earlier, I think the, the most important thing is to break down the natural barriers that exist between corporations and upstream communities, um, between lawyers at those corporations and upstream communities. If you, if you break down those barriers and create real um, respected channels of communication, um, and I don't really even mean just um, professional ones, but but um, something much more collegial than than that might imply. That that can change uh, everything. I I, I think uh, you know some of the problems that Keith was alluding to, um, the companies that uh, are being affected there. I don't think that they are. I don't think they hire a lot of Linux kernel developers. I don't think that they are. They have developed. Um, uh, their own credibility as participants in the Linux kernel community. And the person that Keith is talking about is a longtime Linux kernel developer. And if, if you change that, if your organization is an active participant, if you eliminate that dichotomy between us versus them, and you become part of us, um, you don't make that distinction, I think the entire um, outlook around around what we've been talking about, compliance and, and enforcement, it, it starts to change. And I think even the vocabulary is likely to start to change, as I was kind of trying to get at when I talked about Red Hat. OK, Jim. Now begins the, the last word. Now begins the filibuster. Um, so uh, I guess two, I'll keep it to two and a half points. Um, so w one, I'll, I'll go back to sort of what I was saying, which is that you know we should keep focused on innovating in order to move compliance forward, both at a technical level and also with respect to the legal mechanisms for compliance in order to minimize the risks of things like Keith was talking about, right? That, that, that you know, new structures, we, we need to keep an open mind to new structures around compliance and enforcement Right, ra rather than sort of strictly adhering to old models. Um, and the, the second point is, I, I see a lot of people in this room uh, who I know, many people who, with whom I've worked for years, but also a lot of people that I don't know. And I just want to say to all of you that this is a cool crew you're seeing up on this stage here. These are all kind and awesome people. And the, the, the thing about sort of keeping in contact, uh, collaborating, we all do that. And I can't encourage you strongly enough to come meet us and talk to all of us, right? This is a community and, and amongst each other. Um, and no billable hours. And, and well, so. you know what? And, 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 and you know, Evan and, Evan and Mishi, right? Evan is hiding, but, um, but, but him as well. The, Please, you know, keep keep the li lines of communication open. Introduce yourself. This works much better. The better you know us, and the more we talk. Great. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. A big round of applause for our panelists. Please take advantage of their offer to talk to them. And this is free of cost legal ser service this time. They'll be doing pro bono work. There are great people here, experts. Talk to them. And we'll soon move to our next panel. Um, I just need two minutes break and some reorganizing. So please help yourself with coffee. And let's keep talking. Thank you very much.